Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you have a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we have to talk about today is the Google manifesto story that has just blown up. So this story revolves around James Damore, a Google engineer who published a 10 page anti-diversity manifesto titled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. The document was shared as an internal memo by Damore and detailed how the company should focus more on ideological diversity and less on initiatives to hire more women and people of color. And I'll link to the full PDF in the description down below, but let's go through the highlights of this thing that has spawned such outrage. The document starts off by stating, I value diversity and inclusion. I'm not denying that sexism exists and don't endorse using stereotypes. If we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. At Google, we talk so much about unconscious bias as it applies to race and gender, but we rarely discuss our moral biases. Political orientation is actually a result of deep moral preferences and thus biases. Considering that the overwhelming majority of the social sciences, media, and Google lean left, we should critically examine these prejudices. Adding only facts and reason can shed light on these biases, but when it comes to diversity and inclusion, Google's left bias has created a politically correct monoculture that maintains its hold by shaming dissenters into silence. Neither side is 100% correct, and both viewpoints are necessary for a functioning society, or in this case, company. Then going on to say, on average, men and women biologically differ in many ways. These differences aren't just socially constructed because they often have clear biological causes and links to prenatal testosterone. Biological males that were castrated at birth and raised as females often still identify in act like males. No, I'm not saying that all men differ from women in the following ways or that these differences are just. He then goes deeper into citing specific differences and challenges for women, stating, women on average have more openness directed towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas. Women generally also have stronger interest in people rather than things relative to men, also interpreted as empathizing versus systemizing. Then in a section titled men's higher drive for status, he says, we always ask why we don't see women in top leadership positions, but we never ask why we see so many men in these jobs. These positions often require long, stressful hours that may not be worth it if you want a balanced and fulfilling life. Status is the primary metric that men are judged on, pushing many men into these higher paying, less satisfying jobs for the status they entail. Women, on average, look for more work-life balance, while men have a higher drive for status on average. The male gender role is currently inflexible. Then he tries to offer what he calls non-discriminatory ways to reduce the gender gap, saying women, on average, show a higher interest in people. We can make software engineering more people-oriented with pair programming and more collaboration. Women on average are more cooperative, allow those exhibiting cooperative behavior to thrive. James then lists several discriminatory practices he says Google is guilty of, saying programs, mentoring, and classes only for people with a certain gender or race, a high priority queue and special treatment for diversity candidates, hiring practices which can effectively lower the bar for diversity candidates by decreasing the false negative rate. James also explains why he feels like conservatives are alienated from the conversation, writing, in highly progressive environments, conservatives are a minority that feel they need to stay in the closet to avoid open hostility. James also says, saying Google should focus on psychological safety, not just race, gender, diversity. Writing, we should focus on psychological safety, which has shown positive effects and should not lead to unfair discrimination. Having representative viewpoints is important for those designing and testing our products, but the benefits are less clear for those more removed from UX, user experience design. And James also saying he wants Google to reconsider making unconscious bias training mandatory for promo committees, saying we haven't been able to measure any effect of our unconscious bias training and has the potential for overcorrecting or backlash, especially if made mandatory. Let's spend more time on the many other types of biases besides stereotypes. And as you'd expect, there were many different responses to this. Some, like Kelly Ellis tweeting, I experienced this at Google and was frustrated that they did nothing about rhetoric that was harming employees. Others called for James Damore to be fired and for no one else to hire him. Others, like Emily Gorsensky, taking it a step further, tweeting, I started reading that Googler email and honestly, at this point, if I worked there, I would just walk to his desk and beat the shit out of him. At this point, I'd take the assault charge, if only for the fucking garbage biological essentialism. But on the other side of things, you had people supporting James even before people knew who wrote this. Many saying that this is just freedom of speech. There were articles coming out saying that many at Google don't actually disagree with James. Many saying that if Google fired him, that this is censorship, that the idea of having an open workplace would be bullshit. That's kind of where the story remained for a minute, but then Google responded. Google's Danielle Brown writing, Googlers, I'm Danielle, Google's brand new VP of diversity, integrity, and governance. I started just a couple of weeks ago and I had hoped to take another week or so to get the lay of the land before introducing myself to you all. But given the heated debate, we've seen over the past few days, I feel compelled to say a few words. Diversity and inclusion are a fundamental part of our values and the culture we continue to cultivate. We are unequivocal in our belief that diversity and inclusion are critical to our success as a company and will continue to stand for that and be committed to it for the long haul. So essentially, Google says we're looking into this situation. We want to have a place where people can express their opinions even if we don't agree with them. But we also need to make sure that no anti-discrimination laws are being violated, any of our code of conduct. And I have to say, looking from the outside in, Google was put into a tough spot here. No matter what they did, they were going to 
get hate. So what happened? Well, Google CEO Sundar Pichai told employees that the memo violated Google's code of conduct. And from this, it sounded like James may have been fired. Pichai saying, first, let me say that we strongly support the right of Googlers to express themselves, and much of what is in that memo is fair to debate, regardless of whether a vast majority of Googlers disagree with it. However, portions of the memo violate our code of conduct and cross the line by advancing harmful gender stereotypes in our workplace. Our job is to build great products for users that make a difference in their lives. To suggest a group of our colleagues have traits that make them less biologically suited to that work is offensive and not okay. It is contrary to our basic values and our code of conduct, which expects each Googler to do their utmost to create a workplace culture that is free of harassment, intimidation, bias, and unlawful discrimination. And soon after this happened, James Damore did confirm that he had been fired, saying he was fired for, quote, perpetuating gender stereotypes, adding that he's currently exploring all possible legal remedy. And actually, on that legal note, people have started raising money for his legal case. One of the fundraisers that has been launched is seeking $60,000. It has raised, as of the time of recording this video, just under $5,000. And then, at a left field, Julian Assange pops into the situation and offers James Damore a job, tweeting, censorship is for losers. WikiLeaks is offering a job to fired Google engineer James Damore, also providing a link to a WikiLeaks article written by Assange titled, Google is not what it seems. Then going on to say, women and men deserve respect. That includes not firing them for politely expressing ideas, but rather arguing back. Then providing a link to an article where four scientists actually agree with James Damore on the situation. And so around this story, I would love to know what you think. Do you think that James should have been fired or no, this is ridiculous? Do you think that James crossed the line here and so he should have been removed? Or is his removal just an example of what he said at the beginning of his post? I'd love to know your thoughts on this. I've seen some really interesting arguments. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome. And the first bit of awesome today, I just have to send some love to Miss Gonda Chris, who, oh my God, the nation sometimes very talented. She created a Philly D amiibo with packaging and everything. And this isn't just a massaging of my own ego today in awesome. Because I found this, I went through her archive of photos and she is amazing. She's done a ton of other custom amiibos. If you are even remotely into this, I highly recommend you check her out and follow her. Then that YouTuber by the name of Chet Rio who gave us that fantastic I Am Alive remix of Rick and Morty. Well, he's back at it again with this week's remix of Pickle Rick. Then in awesome on the dodo, I just had to share. A vet locked himself in a hot car for 30 minutes and videotaped the whole thing to show people what happens to a dog when they're stuck in that heat. It's sad that this is apparently not common sense, but it's good to see people putting this out there. And then we got a trailer for the movie Mother, which stars Javier Bardem, Jennifer Lawrence, Ed Harris, Michelle Pfeiffer, and it looks freaky as all hell. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then let's talk about the update around the HBO hack. If you don't remember, the hackers said they had 1.5 terabytes of data from HBO. Some of that included episodes of HBO shows, a script for Game of Thrones. Then on Monday, the Associated Press reported that the hackers had released more internal documents. This including around a month worth of emails from Leslie Cohen, the vice president of film programming. They also released other data, admin passwords, some contact information. And according to The Guardian, that included personal phone numbers, home addresses, email addresses for Game of Thrones stars. And along with that, the hackers who were going by the name Mr. Smith demanded a ransom of at least $6 million to prevent the release of more files. The demand reportedly reading, HBO spends $12 million for market research and $5 million for Game of Thrones advertisements. So consider us another budget for your advertisements. And I will say, even with that threat, I highly doubt that HBO is going to give in to this ransom. I mean, there is the argument that once you pay a hacker, you then entice other hackers to attack you. But I think it's also because we're talking about stolen data, something that is digital, something that is not tangible. I have this one thing, you gave it back to me. I know 100% that after I pay you, you can't still release the same thing. I mean, there's there's no security for them. So that said, it'll be very interesting to see how the story continues to develop. And then let's talk about a story I feel like I've gone out of my way to avoid, despite there being a new element to it pretty much every day, and that is Jake Paul. There's a lot that's happened since the stories about him maybe getting kicked out of his house and him definitely not getting dropped by the Disney Channel. But a lot of the things that happened don't necessarily fit into my news show. But there were two things in the two weeks that we have not talked about Jake that stood out to me. The first being that Jake Paul got even more backlash because of an interaction he seemed to have with a fan. The fan sounds foreign to the United States. He says he's from Kazakhstan and Jake Paul says, It sounds like you're just gonna blow someone up. Thank you so much. You're like, send the nuke. That was a lot of outrage, but then Jake Paul also continued to grow through this. And obviously I mean growing subscribers, not as a person. And then there was something that actually kind of bothered me on August 5th. Jake Paul released a music video that definitely wasn't a diss track, but according to the title was a diss track. And it was at the news or anyone else he is deemed a hater, which I don't know why he's singing. I thought he just dabbed on them. And in this video, Jake Paul, one of the fastest growing YouTubers, one of the top YouTubers, when people think of YouTube, more and more people are thinking of him. He asks the haters, where was y'all at when I was on email trying to stop depressed fans from killing themselves? Oh, and here's my favorite. Where was y'all at 
when Make-A-Wish hit me to meet my girl Kaylee, damn that shit changed me. That is one of the most disgusting things I have ever witnessed. Jake Paul just used this little girl who is sick and her wish was to meet Jake Paul for some reason as moral capital. In my opinion, I understand why people are saying it looks like he used this little girl as a prop. When he actually made the video of meeting Kaylee, that's fine. I bet that made her day. It brought more awareness to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which is a fantastic organization. But then you use the fact that you did that to show that you're a good person. Why is the news not talking about that? Hey Jake, maybe it's because you literally met her 24 hours before you released the music video. Did you write that line before you met her or afterwards you were like, wait a second, this will show I'm a good person. That's disgusting and I and I kind of hate that we're even talking about it because it's, it's like obviously it's on a different level. It just feels like talking about Jake Paul is kind of like if there was a zombie epidemic and every time I talked about the zombie epidemic, more people became zombies. Like 98% of people on the same page, but 2% of people would be like, but being a zombie is savage though. And you just add up all those two and three and four percents of audiences and you have a monster. I just don't know how it's gotten to this point. I used to think Jake Paul was just a CGI creation to make Logan Paul look even better. And then I wanna talk about a design studio that has blown up in the news recently because they are trying to reclaim the swastika. A design group by the name of KA Design launched a line of t-shirts and sweatshirts featuring the new swastika with rainbow colors in the words love, peace, and zen. And they announced this in this fantastic video that they released on July 12th on Facebook called The New Swastika. The video notes that the swastika has been used in numerous cultures to symbolize peace, love, luck, infinity, and life until Nazis took the symbol and turned it into hatred, fear, war, racism and power. It goes on to say the Nazis stigmatized the swastika forever. They limited our freedom, or maybe not. Then introducing their new design to reclaim the symbol. The video urging people to wear the freedom, closing with the design studio's motto, questioning boundaries. And the immediate response to this, some people thought it was a joke, others were quick to call the design insensitive, disgusting, ignorant. Some were on the fence trying to understand the creator's intent. One commenter writing, I get what they are trying to do because the swastika was always a symbol of peace until the Nazis turned it into something terrible and the idea is to reclaim it back to what it was so they no longer have the power. But I do not think slapping a rainbow on a swastika is going to do that. I think the damage is too much to ever reclaim it. Another writing, trying to reclaim the swastika to be edgy is an insult to all the people who lost their lives during the war. I hope you take down that video and issue an apology or your company is going to end up crashing and burning. We get what you were trying to accomplish, but some things need to stay in the past and be burnt. Not everything can and should be reclaimed. So there was the initial backlash and then days after KA Design reworked the shirt to include a circle with a slash over the swastikas. But even after this design change, people called for the shirts to be scrapped and many were confused by this complete U-turn. The brand went from reclaiming the swastika to now selling anti-swastika merchandise. Then, in an attempt to defend the original design idea, an unnamed representative of KA Design spoke with Days Magazine over the weekend. And there they said, we really like the symbol and its shape and aesthetics and we would love to share the beauty of the symbol detached from the hatred associated with it. This project only represents the first step of our master plan and we are excited about what the future will give us. Us. We don't consider ourselves as skilled fashion designers, but more as artists and free thinkers in general. We have some plans for the future that we are not going to reveal. We hope to be able to extend our swastika line to the, fuck that's, I'm sorry, I have to stop. I can't believe I'm reading what I'm reading right now. We hope to be able to extend our swastika line to new design concepts and colors while keeping our current peace message. And the representative also explained that they wouldn't care if Nazis purchased the shirts, saying we think the message of our apparel is clear. Peace, love, and freedom win over hatred, war, and prejudice. If some kind of neo-Nazi goes out wearing our shirt, he will raise the same kind of questions and discussions as a communist wearing the same shirt. That's why we don't care about who buys the shirt. So then at this point, the Anti-Defamation League gets involved and they took to Twitter writing, this is an offensive use of Nazi imagery. Fashion can't reclaim the symbol from hashtag hate. And soon after all of this, the shirts were taken down and KA Design released a statement where they said, hatred and Nazism have won. We brought out the worst in people. We believe in a world of infinite forgiveness. We forgive everyone and we hope to be forgiven. Let love prevail. So that's the story I'd love to to know what you think and I, I just have to throw out my opinion here. The first being that apology didn't really seem like an apology. Hatred and Nazism have won. Why? Because your horrible idea failed? Also, you're forgiving people that aren't apologizing. This apology just reeks of I'm better than you but I'm gonna let it slide because I'm such a good person. I mean, I understand the idea of trying to reclaim something, take the power away from something that is so negative. But I don't see how you're gonna do that with clothing that you are going to profit from. Let's be a part of this movement that shows love, trumps, hate, and 
and also it makes me incredibly rich. It seems like the only way that you would have gotten a little leeway here is if all of the profits from these shirts went to all the different organizations of the people that were the victims of Hitler and the Nazis. And so to me, this just looks like a disgusting, not well thought out cash grab. But I also feel like the swastika doesn't need to be reclaimed. It does serve a purpose in our time still. If you see someone wearing the swastika, that's like a giant sign that says, hey, I'm the fucking worst. But of course, all of this last part is just my opinion. And that's why I pass the question on to you. What is your thought here? Do you get what they're trying to do? Do you support or are you against that? Is there a possible way to try and reclaim the swastika? Is it something that anyone should even do? I'd love to know your thoughts on this. And that's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed and want to catch up on yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you can click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to see the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow.